Do you ever feel confined by modern life? Like there's only a few things open to you and everything else is off limits. Almost like the world is designed to limit your behavior. But then you thought that couldn't be because we've been told all our lives we're free. What does it mean when we talk about the public? The simplest answer is people. But the way the word's used, it means not all the people, but some of them. If we're referring to activities we do outdoors, public means not all such activities, just some of them. We're taught to think of the public as everyone and everything not done in private, but as we'll see, creating a public requires separating activities and even people into categories of the acceptable and the punishable. But it's not all bad. We're also going to see how you can create liberated space, where you can do something other than spend money. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel that makes you shout at your phone on the bus. I began to see how we get divided around the time I started studying politics after 9-11, when the job of a government or think tank spokesperson was to explain to everyone why everyone the state designated a terrorist or insurgent did not deserve any of the rights supposedly afforded everyone. I came to realize this is what divide and conquer means, giving us reasons why we shouldn't consider people people, why some people deserve to have their lives ended or ruined by the state because they didn't conform to the laws and customs we approve of. The basic justification the state uses to perpetuate its existence is it protects the public. But for any given incident, the state gets to decide who constitutes the public. The state legitimizes its actions by separating the targets of its violence from the public. That way, everything it does can be said to serve the public, while it poses a constant threat to whole groups of people that would otherwise be a part of that public. So the state gets to define the word public just like it gets to define order, justice, and security. Let's look at what some of those words mean in practice. First, what is public space? Where is it? Is it in the neighborhoods? Neighborhoods aren't really treated as public space, but as an extension of the property of the residents. And in many places, they don't like strangers. You can walk around a neighborhood if you live there, or if you were invited there to work, and probably also if you're white. But if you aren't white, residents might call the police. In some places, they might try and shoot you. The law says everyone is equal regardless of race, but we all know that's not how it works. Nationalism and racism are the creations of a ruling class keen on divide and rule, which is why they're everywhere today. They play a big role in the policing of people and space, so we'll come back to them. Is there public space downtown? There are buildings, but you aren't allowed in any of them if you're not working or spending money. There are streets, but you're not allowed on the street except at the time and place you're officially permitted to cross. There are sidewalks and alleys, but you're not supposed to loiter, so you have to keep moving. There are parks, which seem perfect for gathering, but unless you have a permit, you're not allowed to gather there either. Police around the world regularly break up protests, even just of people peacefully and quietly occupying public space. They even arrest you for handing out free food. Because if you're not spending money, you're a nuisance. What's more, if you're homeless, an undocumented migrant, or another victim of some kind of segregation, the state shows it doesn't consider you part of the public by forcibly removing you from any space you occupy, however tiny. There are spaces like squares and car parks a homeless person could sleep, but they're owned by some corporation, and the only acceptable use of corporate space is to make money. Other people can own wide tracts of land and multiple houses they don't live in, but you're not allowed to own a corner in a garage or doorway. Even if you just want to go to the bathroom, you're not allowed in anywhere you don't have business to conduct. If you live somewhere with abundant, free, accessible washrooms, great, but if not, where do you go? Outdoors? Seems reasonable. We've been relieving ourselves outdoors since the beginning of time. But recently, some people with private bathrooms decided going outdoors was wrong. So now you're not allowed to do that either. Guess you'll just have to hold it forever. And of course, you're not allowed to post anything on a wall if it doesn't have official state approval. Posters get torn down, graffiti cleaned up, because you're not entitled to a space where you're not being sold something. Only advertisers can legally post their art. Even our view of the sky is owned by advertisers. 
In practice, public space is where a few people own everything, which we only have access to if we have enough money, and the police threaten violence against anyone whose behavior challenges that relationship. Public space is where you're only allowed to go if you're going shopping or to work. So what's public order? When everyone is either going shopping or going to work. Most other activities require permission or are permanently off limits. Anything we do outside those limits can be punished. We internalize the threat of punishment and do as we're told without even being told. Why is our behavior so limited? Because the alternative is to disrupt. Yeah, the powers that be want you making and spending money, but also they don't want you to realize there's so much more you could be doing. If you thought there was more to life than consumerism, like, say, loitering, something fun like skateboarding, or something necessary like stopping a genocide supported by the government you live under, you are a criminal. Go back to the mall, kids. You're not allowed outside. Ever heard life is about the journey, not the destination? Public order means only destinations, the office and the mall. These people are confined. They're restrained by the threat of state violence, but also by the limits of their imaginations. Having never experienced the joy of a truly public space or thinking of it as an annual corporate advertising event keeps us from desiring any more freedom than what little we have. So if public space limits where we're allowed to go and public order limits our behavior, does public safety mean some people are less safe? I think this post says it all. A public safety officer at the City University of New York told people protesting genocide he supported killing them all. Maybe he's a Zionist, but my guess is his motivation is just to reassert control over the space he considers his. It didn't matter these students weren't hurting anyone physically. They were undermining authority. There is no greater sin. I do not advocate a police state, Fowler. No, you just want to see everyone live in abject fear of authority. Well, it would be not! Public safety means police separating anyone they say they suspect of a crime from the public and doing harm to them. Public safety is a threat of violence. People don't mind living under this involuntary relationship because they assume police are necessary for safety and only use their violence against people who've done something bad. When people say, but that person's a criminal. They're letting the state decide who they will respect and who deserves pain. But punishment isn't reserved for those really bad people doing the really bad crimes they prosecute on law and order. Most crimes that get punished are property crimes, drug offenses, border violations, crimes that don't warrant punishment but should make us look at how systems of violence force people to take such risks. What's more, it's hypocritical to want to apply the law to other people because no one follows the law. No one believes in applying the law equally and no one follows every law. Have you ever crossed the street where you weren't supposed to? Have you ever driven over the speed limit? Have you ever had a garage sale? Have you ever used a fake name online? Have you ever shared your Netflix password? Have you ever downloaded anything? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are a criminal and the authorities have been informed. And if you answered no to all of them, you're presumably Amish? So why is it you obviously don't deserve to be punished for those activities, but someone else who doesn't follow the law or police orders to the letter deserves to be fined, arrested, and imprisoned? Or should we only be punished for certain violations, only of the laws you believe in? Everyone who says they believe in the law also thinks they and the people they like should be exempt because they've been told all their lives that they're the public and hurting other people keeps them safe. People say they care about crime or serious crimes and that's why they like seeing criminals get caught, but they always have reasons why petty thieves and drug dealers deserve years in cages, why police need to retain the power to pull you over and shoot you at any time, while people with power who kill thousands of people deserve to lose elections. This is the kind of double standard the idea of the public is based on. The respectable people like you and the president on one side, the criminals who only understand the language of force on the other. Vigilantes, nearly all white men, take on the role of police and kill people they decide are a threat to the public. On June 5th, two weeks ago, Aaron Brown Myers shot and killed an unarmed teenager in a parking lot in Washington state. Myers saw three brown boys returning a BB gun to 
a store and assumed they were going in to rob the store. Being a panicky bootlicker determined to protect property, he pointed a gun at them and gave them commands as if he were a cop. He put his hands on them as if he were a cop, then got scared and shot one of them seven times, just like if he were a cop. He told the police repeatedly the teens wouldn't follow his commands. What does it say that it feels so normal for these white guys to point guns at people and issue them orders? If you're in one of the groups these self-appointed public defenders feel threatened by, public space means the threat of murder. Many people like the law because they know it'll be enforced most harshly on black people, native people, sex workers, homeless people, and migrants by police on the hunt for fresh bodies for prison slavery. The public is everyone it is assumed needs protecting against the scary groups of people. People break the law everywhere, but the police just happen to concentrate where poor black people live. And the vigilantes just happen to target black people for crimes like begging on the subway. The jurisdiction of those charged with upholding public order extends right to the border, even if there are no people there. If someone with a badge, and increasingly without one, sees you crossing a line in the desert you couldn't even even see, you might have to go live in a cage for a few years, if they let you live. You're not considered part of the public because you're from the other side of that line. Any amount of violence at any cost is just fine as long as we keep those people I don't know separate from these people I don't know. We're taught to fear a situation where the state or some other authority is not in control, at least with people we don't know, and especially with people we don't want to know. We learn to say, without the state's order, it would be chaos. But what does that mean? If you want to say it would mean, like Thomas Hobbes hypothesized, everyone running around killing everyone else, well, I've given a million examples on this channel that would disprove Hobbes. And stay tuned, because I'm going to give a couple more today. Order and chaos are just two ways of looking at the same situation. We all know the results of state order, war, slavery, white supremacy, patriarchy, even, as I explained last time, famines and epidemics. If we challenge those things, we're agents of chaos. I watch a perfectly executed robbery on a jeweler's and think, what order? What skill? What grace? Other people say this is the chaos that results from not having five police on every street corner. Notice, by the way, the name of this video is Violent Smash and Grab, because hurting property is violence. Hurting people who aren't designated part of the public is just restoring public order. But what if you don't like public order, public space, or public safety? What if you want freedom? What if you reject the state's attempts to confine us to certain spaces and activities? What if you don't accept being divided by class, race, and passport and want to open up space to everyone? What would happen? In 2011, inspired by their cousins in Tunisia, Egyptians poured into the streets in protest of their government. They fought with cops, then burned police stations, then burned the headquarters of the ruling National Democratic Party. They came together in Tahrir Square, which is kind of in the center of Cairo and therefore, in a way, in the center of Egypt. There isn't a ton of public space in Egypt, and Tahrir is one of the only places other than the desert where a million people could gather. People also made spaces in their neighborhoods to convene local assemblies where they could govern themselves without being forced to let the state do it for them. This is horizontal organizing, as I talked about a few weeks ago. They created a liberated space where they could talk to each other, where they could openly voice views that would have got them a visit from the police before. They could talk about what needed to be done and organize to make it happen. On a side note, around this time I was getting into anarchism, and people would tell me we're not ready for real democracy and control over our own lives. And then we watched people who had lived under dictatorship for generations do it overnight. Discouragingly, some of the same people felt compelled to find reasons why this was all just a fluke, even though something similar happens every time there's an uprising. Others believed reports that things were Hobbesian chaos and people were killing each other, when it would have been more accurate to report that police were killing civilians, which again is the norm in every uprising. And when the police left, things were mostly free and peaceful. But naysayers are gonna nay. Meanwhile, the model of occupying public space and deciding by General Assembly spread to movements around the world, and in September it reached the United States. 
It took on the name Occupy, with Occupy Wall Street the biggest and best-known encampment. Agendas were set collectively. Decisions were made collectively, taking everyone's needs into account. Anarchist spaces tend to employ non-hierarchical decision-making already. But for most people who joined, Tahrir and Occupy provided a liberated space to experience those things for the first time. So what happens in a liberated space? Well, anything could happen, of course. Someone might set up a food bank. Another might give away clothing. People with medical backgrounds might show up to provide some free service. There might be a place to donate tools, books, or other stuff someone might want. And depending where in the world you are, there are probably some people dancing. You might have the chance to see all this if there's a pro-Palestine student encampment near you. By taking over public space, Tahrir and Occupy proved these spaces were never public in the sense of being for everyone and everything, only public as in owned by some corporation and controlled by the police. Mass occupations create spaces for people to find each other, to organize without hierarchy and live beyond the reach of owners and rulers. They present a new way of making decisions that puts anyone who comes along in the driver's seat. Millions of people organized to build a new world in the shell of the old. I like liberated space, spontaneous order, and safety for everyone. The more we organize and prepare today, the better our chances. But liberating space is just one way of fighting for freedom and a better world. If you want to learn about other ways, subscribe and check out all my other videos. Thanks for being here.